Welcome back. I'm here again with one of my favorite guests, Dr. Sean McFate. How are you doing, Sean? Doing great. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing well. Uh, always good to see you. It sounds like the school year is up and running. You're starting to get busy and uh, students are talking about the two interesting peer competitors nowadays, namely Russia and China. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few future episodes. But that said, today, we're going to talk about what is a strategist? And I'm going to start off with that question, Sean. What is a strategist? It's a great question because, in my opinion, we certainly don't have any in Washington, (laughs) D.C., at least none with any sort of authority. I mean, a strategist, in terms of national security and international politics, a strategist, we think of great strategists, you know, like them or hate them. Effective strategists are people like Kissinger or Bismarck in the 19th century or Mm -hmm. I would argue General George Marshall during World War II, who was a chief of staff of the army, people who see broad trend lines, macro th- trends in the in, in the world, and then also can, can kick their own bureaucracy to meet those trends in creative and imaginative ways. And they're not just reactionary thinkers. You know, as the old saying goes, you know, you know it when you see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's from a Supreme Court case about pornography by mm-hmm. Jester Stuart Potter, I think his name is, you know, you see it, you know, a good strategist, they have, they have a certain uh, genius for seeing things that others do not, and also know how to move things. It's not just seeing it's, it's reacting. So we don't really have that. Now we have something else in Washington, other countries have it though. And which countries do you think do it really well? Well, I think until this year, Putin did it very well. And then he blew it by trying to take Ukraine using obsolete conventional war strategies. I think China is doing it reasonably well. I don't want to overstate how well they're doing it, but they are doing it. It's like, a, you know, it's a positive slope. You know, I mean, they're 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 succeeding. Are they succeeding as much as they'd like? No. Are they failing? No. But they're doing a lot of interesting things too. And 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 we could talk about why they have these, you know, and why we don't, which is actually a more interesting question because yeah. the US used to have really good strategists. And now in the last 30 years, we're like, you know, intellectually bereft. Not that we have intellectually bereft people. We have great people, but the ones who find themselves in Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, National Security Council, and and because of course presidents, they are just, you know, to say out to lunch is a it would be a euphemism. Oh, let me let me stop you there real quick. So we'll just one aside, and we'll talk about this in a future episode. Don't count Putin out because I see where he's going, and I think in December things are going to be a little bit different. But we'll, well he's we'll, already we'll get changed. To that. Yeah, we'll get to that. I mean, he's already done a strategic adaptation in April to recover from his past mistakes. But, you know, Putin's a very savvy guy and he Mm -hmm. is a strategist. I mean, he took, we'll talk about it, but I agree with that. He's not out. And as much as people in Washington, D.C. would like to believe he's out, I don't think we've seen the last of Mr. Putin. Well, I can almost almost see what's going to unfold then. And it's you know, you can see the strategy unfolding pretty clearly if you know what to yeah. look for. But we'll get we'll get obviously get to that. Okay, so so to your point, we don't have as many or if any strategists anymore. When did that change? What happened and why? So the US used to have some cunning strategists throughout the Cold War. And then when the Cold War ended, it seems that trend ended with it. And I think the Cold War gave a certain focus to the United States of America, the threat of nuclear annihilation, the Cuban Missile Crisis, all those did a couple of things. First of all, it created a certain bipartisanship within Capitol and Congress that the Republicans and Dems had their differences, but when it came to Soviet, you know, what should we do with the Soviet Union, there was general agreement that that was a problem. 
They had yeah, different what was solutions. It, what yeah. was the saying? Politics ends at the at the, at the shoreline or the shore's like edge or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that was not exactly true. But I mean, it's not like today. There was the, the disagreements back then in foreign policy and national security were like, was the volume setting? Do we set it at like the, the Dems might set it at six and the Republicans might set it at nine? You know, out of ten. You know, Carter is his own his own administration, but the strategic logic of containment, which just started in 1950, pretty much endured for those, you know, 40 years. Different administrations prioritized different aspects of it, but it was a coherent logical strategy that was effective by and large. And also it created like, you know, back in the day in in universities, if you want to get in national security, you spent your time in political science studying the USSR. I mean, it created all this and there, and it wasn't um, trying to argue about pronouns. Then the the Berlin wall falls down, the Soviet Union, you know, disappears almost overnight. And our country doesn't know what to do because we we sort of came of strategic age in the Cold War. We came out of the World War II. We entered World War II as a second-rate power. We came out as a superpower. Mm-hmm. And then we really honed that throughout the Cold War. And then, but it was always in sort of uh, dialogue or in a dialectic with the USSR. And without that, we, we lost our own identity as to who we were. And the 1990s was all about craziness. Like you have people like Frank Fukuyama, who's now at Stanford at the Hoover Institute. You know, it's like, it's the end of history and political utopia on one side to like Sam Huntington, who I think we may both have had at Harvard, who's like, it's the mm-hmm. clash of civilizations, it's going to be mayhem. And the 1990s was kind of like, for US foreign policy, a missed decade. We kind of went introspective, we did, we, we, we futzed around in the Balkans, we didn't really know what we were doing. Then 9-11 happened, all these things happened that your viewers will know about, 9-11, Iraq, Afghanistan. And all those were strategic shots on our own foot because of strategic errors. And the reason, well, there's many reasons, but the primary reason is that we lack good strategic IQ. So with, again, we had this machine and we had a lot of World War II vets and stuff like that who were part of like the Cold War. They go away and who becomes national security advisors and all, you know, all these people are either like very theoretical academics, like Tony Lake under Clinton, who is a UMass guy. You had uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice, or you have apparatchiks like Susan Rice, people who were basically coattail writers, you know, people Mm -hmm. who had really, they had only lived inside the Beltway of Washington, D.C. They only spoke that language. They had no experience beyond that. I mean, if you look at like the Reagan administration, I think we had like, if you look at the assistant secretary defense level, we had some pretty big minds there, like Richard Armitage and some others, I believe. And we don't have that. We have people who are like Samantha Power, who's also somebody we know, but like she doesn't bother, you know, she's like theory in search of fact. And right. so, you know, or oh, and, and by the way, a lawyer by training. And a lawyer right. by training. And, you know, or we have this idea like we're going to go to Iraq because we believe in this idea called democratic peace theory, which is a political science theory out of the 1990s that democracies don't fight each other. So if we can sort of magically unleash the secret, you know, democracy genes of Iraqis and have elections, everything else will they'll become a, a democracy and it will spread. There won't be any war in the Middle East. I mean, nonsense like that. So we had basically the nonsense wagon move in to the Beltway in, in, a, in the last 30 years. And that's one reason is that we have political appointees whose merits they're what I call the office-seeking class of Washington, D.C., or the syncophantic class. And they, they, they live in think tanks when they're not in power and they go into power. Another reason is that war colleges, like where I'm a professor, don't teach strategy. What they do is they teach like World War II history. And then they reimagine this guy called uh, Karl von Clausewitz 
who is a very influential Prussian military theorist from the Napoleonic era. Now he's got things to say, but we, he's like, he's like the prophet of war in the Pentagon. People always try to quote him. They use his text on war, like biblical scripture. They quote things out of context with authority. It's, it's nonsense. And I think what we need to do, and this is controversial, but I think it's required is that we need to change the way we think about what kind of thinking is required for strategic thought. And I think what we need are more liberal arts in the military mm-hmm. community and not what we're doing right now. Or a mixture of both, right? I think you, you need some quantitative underpinning, but you also yep. need to have that broad sweep of, of history as well as just basic economics, because everything you do from that military lens is going to have some economic implication. It's yep. also going to have some historical implication that you have to solve for. It's almost like having some sort of a, a matrix, right? Where yeah. you where you go through and systematically view these things, not only from what your aim is, but also what your what your core interests or your vital interests are and how yeah. they they help. The, but the, the other problem is everything's too short-sighted in the West. Mm-hmm. You know, we think in very brief timelines for pres- presidential administration to presidential administration. And the power of that office is that something happens and the entire, no matter what long-term strategy you had running in the background, it's going to get completely subverted by, you know, you just look at what happened with September 11th, right? Our entire national security infrastructure shifted over a period of 15 to 20 years. You look at the rise of JSOC we were talking about before the call yeah. and how very specialized, I mean, they became, they, they, are, are certainly an amazing organization, but they became very fine-tuned to this counterterrorism operation. So what happens when you telescope out of that and you have to look at new threats? There's going to be a, a, you know, a, 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 a sea change in, what, in terms of where you're going to have to organize and, and refit and, and, and find, find a way. And the other thing, too, is that we do have the advantage of having a permanent bureaucracy in some sense. So how do we shift that so that it can sustain against these constant and sclerotic changes at the top every yeah. time we have an election? And by the way, it's only going to get more and more yeah. extreme on both sides as, as we kind of go into the future. So we, we need an inst- you know, institutional strength you know, more than ever now. So, yeah. I so mean, if I would you, say that yeah, if yeah. there's no courses on this, why yeah. aren't there? And and why and why aren't you why aren't you starting one? Well, I, I do have one. I do run the strategic, I'm the director of the strategic thinking program at the at and at National Defense University at my college, which is the College of International Security Affairs. So just so your viewers know, it is that the US Department of Defense has actually quite a few war colleges out there, not just one, mm-hmm. they have a few. And what do you know? There's the Army one, Army War College is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The Navy War College is in Newport, Rhode Island. There's a Marine one, an Air Force one, and the sort of the tip, the you know, the biggest one is in Washington, D.C. It's called National Defense University. It has five war colleges under it. Mine, College of National Security Affairs, focuses on irregular warfare. Whereas the army focuses is more on land power, the navy on sea power. So each one has its has its specialty, and they all teach strategy. Fortunately, I think that strategy is their vision of strategy is still kind of it's based on World War II. Ultimately, it's based on conventional war, a form of warfare from you know a hundred almost a hundred years ago, and what they and you know you've heard. The saying that generals always like to fight the last war, especially if they won it. Mm. This is this is the dearth of strategic thinking. <laughs> and we see this, and it's not just a US thing. It's like, look at France after World War One. They thought the future of war looked just like the last successful one, trench warfare. So they built the Maginot Line. Which the Germans, you know, they they evolved their way of warfare, not flanked. It's this is like sort of a theme in history of why do mm-hmm. successful countries sort of want to relitigate the last war rather than stay, you know, 
innovate, you know, and I guess there's, I think there's some business parallels here to, you know, we get caught in a dominant logic trap. It's sort of like blockbuster, not realizing the future of streaming and not adapting to it. It's, it's the same in the armed forces and strategy, you know, and so what we need is we need, how do you create innovative, disruptive thinking, but within a military culture, that's all about regimented thinking. Mm -hmm. And so that is the challenge. And I think the way you do it is that I think you have to get really creative. And and we've talked offline, Sean, about this, but like we're both big fans of the Orson Scott card and, you know, an Ender's game. And can we do something like that? I think we need, when I say we need more liberal arts, I agree with you. It's got to be a melange of quantitative as well, but we need something like, I mean, if you go to, if you go to West Point or Annapolis and you major in English, you still get a BS degree, Bachelor of Science, because it's a, such a heavy engineering program. Right. And so you get trained to think like an engineer that there are solvable problems. And while that's a certain type of genius, it's not the genius we need at the strategic level when you're dealing with very ambiguous problems. And we need to get thinkers who are comfortable around ambiguity and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And you don't do that with an engineering mindset and you don't do that relitigating the last war. So I think we need to be very creative. Now, what does that look like? I don't know, I'd be curious to see what some of your viewers have in mind. I think that the military needs an infusion of creativity, in the classroom. And I think that there's other disciplines out there who might have a lot to share, but it's kind of right now that the war college system is a little bit more abundant, in my opinion. Well, and there's also a systematic reason that you haven't seen this emergence of strategic thinking. And that is primarily, if you talk to any military officer, if you even talk to an intelligence officer in the CIA, they will tell you, we do not make policy. Yeah. We execute policy. So like in the system, they're systematically discouraged from coming up with solutions that are policy solutions, which by default ends up falling to either academia or the political hacks who get into office. And more often than not, it's the political hacks because the set of skills you need to get the job is not the set of skills that you need to succeed at the job. It's like like they're the Robert Baratheon's of the right. political world, right? That's like right. That's terrible right. king, terrible king, but very good yeah. at seizing the throne. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. King colors. Yeah. So it's exactly right. So here's the, the problem in a nutshell, is that you have some very talented people in the bureaucracy. Now, to rise in the bureaucracy, you've got to become a company man, sort mm-hmm. of an empty suit in a peacetime country, right? So to rise, you have to like, become a yes man. That's just the way large organizations work. Now, during a real war, a total war, that's changes. We, we'll talk about that in a second. But so these, these people who are like, say, mid-career or mid, mid-management, mid some of them have some good ideas, but they're forbidden from really making policy recommendations. So who makes those recommendations? It's political appointees who are, you know, who are, you know, cause great groaning within the bureaucracy, you know, they're, because they're not, they're, they're, there are interns in that organization who are more qualified than those senior policymakers. And I, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to name names, but I could, I know the national defense world very well. And, you know, there's, there's exceptions, but generally not. Just, 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 just an aside to the audience. He will, he will tell me after this call. I, will, <laughs> I just won't, I, will. I just won't and so, and we might know a few people in common from our own backgrounds, but yeah. So there's a lot of that. I think you also have like the influence class of of like op-ed writers and think tanks, and and uh, if you ever want to read, there's a lot of group mentality, herd mentality, group think. And if you ever want to read Washington D.C., what the herd is thinking on any topic, just read Foreign Affairs. Okay, mm-hmm. Foreign Affairs is like the consensus journal. It has a lot of prestige, but it's really kind of a group think. And they they kind of push, they're like on, they're trying to push the group think a little bit, but they're very much inside the lane, you know? And then what happens is you get these, these young upstart other alternative journals, like initially foreign policy in the 1970s. 
And then once it becomes successful, they go mainstream. And then there was a last 10 years, another there's an online magazine called War on the Rocks, which is read very heavily in the in the in the beltway in the defense community. Now they've gotten successful and they've become mainstream. So there's also a lesson here too. If you want to be like punchy, a little revolutionary, a, a venue for new ideas th that are kind of counterculture, you know, and, and with the Ratatouille principle, like anybody, not everybody can be a great strategist, but a great strategist can come from anywhere. So if some sergeant writes this great idea, it can find its way into War on the Rocks. Well, no longer, because now War on the Rocks has become like a consensus thing. And so it's interesting to see how maybe it's business incentives or something else that a lot of these, what starts as an innovative entrepreneurial space for new thinking as it becomes more successful, gets co-opted <laughs> by the herd. So there, there actually is a term for it. Are you, are you familiar with the late Jerry Purnell? No, no, no. So no. He's, a, he's a science fiction author, former army officer, was an artilleryman. His son's actually a naval officer. I think he works in naval intelligence. And he had this, what he called the iron law of bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. And the way that worked is every organization starts out with the idea people, the people who prosecute the organization for the, its orig original rationale. I'm try the point is the point of an organization is what causes it to initially flourish and grow. But over time, instead of being about that purpose, the purpose of organization inexorably shifts to preservation of the organization. Yeah, and right. when the purpose shifts from the original purpose to preserve the organization of all costs, it's because you have these the bureaucrats, it gets bureaucratized, yeah. mm -hmm. and they become more concerned with the expansion of the organization. The UN is probably a great example of that. Or, right or the CIA or something like that, right? I mean, right, right. I mean yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, so, and what, what's even more ironic is that Every every 10 years, somebody says, OK, we need we can't reform this large organization. So we're going to build a smaller, innovative one in it, you know, so I'll have an offshoot of it. So, you know, there's, there's a CIA, then there was a national security agency and there was other things or and the DOD. And so what happened then eventually it gets, you know, taken over by the Borg and it just ironically just grows and grows and grows. And you, I think that's absolutely right. Is that the first generation the founding fathers and mothers are very innovative entrepreneurial thinkers. But, and as soon as that gets successful, then it's about, we must maintain the equities and interests of the organization above mm -hmm. all else. And I think then you have this bureaucratic beast that likes to micromanage too. So you have like commanders in the uh, Afghanistan war on the ground to, to like take out a high value target. You know, they have to like wire it all the way up to the National Security Council and wire it all the way down. And then you have, you know, it's just ridiculous. So, I, you know, all these things is what creates this not just entrenched bureaucracy and a strategic culture of bureaucracy, but also like if you are a true strategic thinker, you're a revolutionary thinker. You know, you are an entrepreneurial thinker. You're a creative thinker. That is what creates strategic ideas, um, not just defending the, you know, the bureauc bureaucratic interests. And that's what we have between the political appointees who are generally, you know, pretty hopeless, honestly, to the bureaucracy, which is interested in their own equities. You know, you get a country that's asleep at the switch. And of course, election cycles every 48 years, we flip flop because we don't have a grand strategy, which is a guiding document to to rationalize or give some sort of cohesion to all the interagency. We have none of that. Now, when it, you know, so the question is, how do we change it? And usually for a big country like ours to change really the way, not just our strategy, but our way of warfare unfortunately requires a lot of blood. I mean, think about like the US Civil War. We had all those like hacks that the bureaucracy kicked out for the, for the union side 
from McClellan to, you know, Hooker to others who are just really, they talked big, but they couldn't command. And they, until Lincoln found Grant, General Ulysses Grant, who was a washout as a peacetime officer. He was to West Point, bottom of his class. He left as a drunk as a first lieutenant or something and was in Ohio, like selling dry goods when, when the Civil War kicked off. And, you know, and it just shows you that there are differences between peacetime generals and wartime generals. Mm -hmm. And a peacetime general is a political politician bureaucrat. And a wartime general is the creative, takes bold risks, et cetera. That is like your patents. That's like your grants. And you can't do that. Even, even, even your mentor, McChrystal, right? Yeah, even my mentor, McChrystal, right. Who, who stood up JSOC and was very mm -hmm. innovative. But when he was in charge of CENTCOM in Afghanistan, he was then the onslaught of the blob of the Washington because it came upon him and he wasn't able to negotiate that as well. But this is the point is that, you know, for the union side to get to Grant, they had to have a lot of blood spilled before they got desperate enough to be willing to give innovation a chance. And that's usually what it takes. And so there are people like myself and the, there are lots of people in Washington and others who are part of what we call like an intellectual insurgency, trying to change the way we think about strategy, asking basic questions like, what is war? Is it, you know, you know, is, is weaponizing mm -hmm. refugees, is that war? Should we use disinformation as well? I mean, how do you fight warfare in the 21st century? Because it's not going to look like the 20th century, which is what most war colleges are teaching. They're teaching World War II with better technology, right? That's not how war works anymore. That's not how you achieve victory. We all remember this, mission accomplished, right? President Bush, in 2003, we achieved perfect battlefield victory over the Iraq military. By old war standards, that should have been a you know victory. It was irrelevant to our war, irrelevant. So what a real strategist can do is they can diagnose the contemporary and they can make prescriptions to how to, how to succeed. And what we get and what we have now are people looking over their shoulder to past glories of 1945, bureaucrats who just want to, you know, enlarge their own bureaucracy and political hacks who are trying to make a name for themselves. They don't care, even if they don't understand what's going on. And they're just basically part of the obsequious classes. Yeah, I, I can't. Po view. Yeah, I can't. I can't possibly imagine being in one of those roles where you just literally have no idea what's going on. And you're trying to give orders to people who know infinitely more than you do and just not feel out of your depth in doing it. It's just well, so they, much shameless. You know, it, it. well, first of all, they lack a shame gene, many of them, and, and they're generally clueless. They are, their ego gets in the way of their common of sense. So most of them are totally, and the, the bureaucracy handles them too. The bureaucracy is actually quite skilled at going around them. Now, not all of them are bad. There are some good ones. We sometimes get lucky. But we'd rather be smart than lucky. And right now we're more lucky than smart. So there are some good ones out there. But there are some who do a lot of damage, some, some deliberately so, some just they don't know what's going on. Best case scenario, they make no impact in anything. But then that raises other concerns of, you know, bureaucracies, you know, who are doing what's best for the bureaucracy, not what's best for the nation. And that's another concern entirely. So how do we fix this? Well, I think one of the things is that we have to, like, unlike the Cold War, everybody could point to a nuclear threat that can annihilate this country in 20 minutes. And that sort of galvanized a certain degree of rationality, logic, the necessity for compromise, et cetera. And one of the things our adversaries are getting very good at is they don't want to get us riled up. So they wage war, but make it look like peace to our standards. And this way, they don't like tempt the wars, the war reaction, because everybody knows that America, if you piss America off enough, we will freak the crap out. Look what happened after 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. Americans are very slow to get riled up, but when they decide on something, they stick to it. So what that's taught everybody from China to Russia is if you want to like poke the bald eagle, 
don't do it. You want to wage war, but keep it distracted. And so they do things like in, in like Russia, they weaponize refugees. Like they'll take all these refugees from Afghanistan, from Syria, and they'll throw them at, at the EU borders to create, you know, politics that, you know, are really, you know, we, you know, against, it's hard to explain. They do this, they, they kind of, they can encourage things like the Brexit, you know? And so, you know, it's always been the Kremlin's strategic objective in the Cold War and today to break up the EU, to break up NATO. And so they weaponize refugees. Now, we don't view that as a weapon of war. We view that as a humanitarian crisis. And the truth is, it's not an either or, it's an and equation. It can be both. Mm-hmm. But our strategic thinking is so ossified that we are incapable of that nuanced thinking to accept the new and to think about it in a in a nuanced way. And that's what we need more of. We need people who are who can see that and who can also be nuanced thinkers critical thinkers, creative thinkers to come up with new solutions and not just use old, you know, obsolete repertoires. That's what we do now. We just have all these repertoires of policies that, oh, it worked in 1962, so we should just some version of it now. It's not how things succeed in the world. Now, where would we recruit these people? So this is the question, because one of the problems in the U.S. military is by the time an officer <clears throat> gets to, first of all, they're all officers. By the time they get to a war college, they've got like 15 to 20 years already into a military career. Mm-hmm. Why do we wait that long? Let's do it when people are, are midshipmen in Annapolis, you know, cadets at ROTC. And, you know, let's do it early. Let's do a strategic education at the beginning. Also, why can't non-commissioned officers be educated, right? Let's work this into non-commissioned officer education at every step of the way. Also, there are really no strategy programs in the civilian sector. So war colleges do this. There are no war colleges in civilian universities. I mean, well, they do. No, there's plenty, there's plenty of strategy, but it's not for... It's not applied to government. It is applied to business, right? right. So you have four, Porter's five forces. That's you have, right. We don't, uh, but but, do but it way. is. I I would, uh, but we do. But the private sector does do it better yeah. than the government does. So let's let's. So historically, the business, the private sector, and the military sector have been swapping lessons learned with each other for decades, mm-hmm. and I think there's some importance to that because look here's another critical example I mean, so just to back up in your question like there are s- some universities have some individual professors and programs that do teach this stuff but many of them some of them exist but are bad they teach political science theory in lieu of strategy which is not the same thing right, right. liberalism versus something else that's not strategy and then there's business but you know are there business you know, how do we adapt those things? Because, I, you know, game theory, I think, is the wrong type of modeling for national security strategy. But there are the there are tools well, that I think I, could help. So so game theory had a place. I think game theory was what prevented us from going to thermonuclear war. But game theory only works or works the best. I shouldn't say only works well, works the best when you can con- when you have a highly constrained problem and in the, in the, you know, cold war, we had a bipolar world. It was all about if, you know, if, if my adversary has this many missiles and I have that many missiles, how many cities do I have left? Can I, you know, so it, it was much more easy to package as a game theoretic problem, but the problems that we're facing now have a lot more, interdependencies, right? So you're not just talking about, for the most part, purely military power. You're talking about a lot of interdependencies with economies, with private business, with trade. If you notice when we started having problems with China, it was like, oh crap, every electronic device is produced in Shenzhen in the world, yeah. right? Like, whoops. So there's there's well, there's yeah. things like that that are like that, that you miss that you don't consider when you go through this. And the second piece is particularly pointing out a book like New Rules for War or The New Rules for War 
there's nonlinear, there's a bunch of nonlinearities. It's not, right. we're not dealing with linear situations anymore. There's a ton of chaos theory. There's, there's things that we don't necessarily incorporate well in these kind of second generation warfare sort of texts and con- conceptions of the world. So yeah. I don't know where I was going with that, but I think well, I was just the, riffing the, up what you're the, saying. The point is, is that, you know, game theory had a role in the 1950s with the Soviet U.S. missile exchange. But I think the problem is, is that warfare has become more nonlinear by design because mm-hmm. it works. And we can discuss why that works and why it's, it's more chaos theory. The game theory is what wins these days. And I don't think that trend's going to change. And so we need strategic thinkers who can think about nonlinearity. And that's not going to come out of a bureaucracy, right? right. Who right. are purely linear thinkers. It's not going to come out of a sycophant whose true skill is impressing your boss. That's the real superpower. And so where does it come out? It has to come out from outside. Fortunately, it's really hard to influence the military because you're either in or you're out of the military world. You can't, there's no mid-career entry point into the U.S. Navy. You have to, you know, and so, and and they try to go out and they try to find thinkers, but most of them are the, they don't find the right thinkers or they find thinkers who give them really good ideas and the military just disregards it, you know? So, you know, but I think like this is a, this is a worthy cause because I believe I have a six-year-old son. So, you know, Ratatouille, the, the movie, Ratatouille that I have mentioned it before, I think, is that it's the Ratatouille principle. Like not everybody can be a great strategist, but a great strategist can come from anywhere. And let's try to find a farming system. <laughs> that sounds awful when you say it that way. Find a way to recruit that out of undergraduate college, you know? And I don't know how we'd, you know, select for that. There are smarter people than, than me, but we need people who can think about basically uh, wicked problems, a non-linear complexity, all these things. And then how do we focus their minds? I mean, it would be great to have a program where, and that becomes people's a career path rather than, you know, because right now it's not that way. If you want to become a four-star general in the U.S. Army, you start as an infantry officer. There's a very linear path and it's all based on tactics and conventional war. And if you get somebody at the top who can think beyond that, then you're just lucky. Most, yeah. most generals can't do it. They're not bred to do it. I mean, and they can't think about things like economic warfare because that's going to be a thing in our lifetime. Because, you know, again, we have a, a military that's looking at the Cold War for lessons and there was no economic war because you had two distinct economic blocks the Soviet bloc and the free trade bloc. And they didn't really interact. Now we're all one big free trade bloc. The dark arts of economic warfare are there. And it's one of the oldest forms of warfare in human history. And we have, you know, the US military doesn't have the sophistication or the US government doesn't have the sophistication to really use that or defend against it. And some of those, that knowledge, some of that talent's not going to come from a U.S. government federal position. It's going to come from outside. So how do we, how do we, how do we get that? So why not the think tanks? Are they also just part of this iron law of bureaucracy at this yeah, point? They are part of the, yeah. so what think tanks have ossified into, have turned into is morphed, transmorphed into are weak lobbyists. And now there are some really good think people at some, I work at a think tank. I've worked at a few there are some really good people, but by and large, the whole think tank community, there are exceptions, but the, by and large, they depend on corporate sponsorship. So if your think tank has a program on defense, which they all do, guess who your big sponsors are? <clears throat> Lockheed, Lockheed Martin, Martin. Raytheon. Yep. And, and so there's an old oh, joke in the DC community. I think there's like research agenda. You give us the agenda, we'll do the research. Or, and or, it's where political appointees go to hang out between administrations. So every time there's a switch between a Republican and a Democrat president administration, they all dump into the think tank. So if a Republican takes over in 2024, all the Biden people are going to go into the liberal think tanks. 
And if like, you know, if, if a Republican president, you know, leaves and a, and a Democrat come in, they go into their conservative think tank. So think tanks act as like a, as a holding pen for like all these political politicos. Now, again, there are there is some good work. I don't want to like cast shade in the whole community, but this idea that they are honest brokers and they do objective research, by and large, that's not true. I mean, the fact that you have left-leaning think tanks versus right-leaning think tanks says that. And also, the more extreme the think tank, the richer it will be. So the ones that are more objective, like more middle of the road, like CSIS, are mm -hmm. generally poor because you have big foundations on the left and big, you know, wealthy people on the right who have, they want to get a political message out. They go to the more, you know, if you're a lefty, you go to Center for American Progress, you know, and they're well-funded. If you're a righty, you go to something like Heritage or something like that. I mean, Heritage is a strange model, but like they, the, the more neutral, the more, if you will, professional you are, the more destitute you will be. And so mm -hmm. think tanks are sort of like poor lobbyists in that way, because they're really be, they're trying to influence the Hill, they're trying to influence policy, and they're trying to write op-eds. And that's not what think tanks used to be. To some extent. Now, what about de novo organizations like funding and then, you know, <laughs> kind of make use of their early five years and then instead of having an evergreen structure, fold it and then move on to a, a new model? So the problem is, though, it's not, it's easy, it, it's very easy to say, but once the money starts rolling in, you have an incentive to. To tell well, you, people what they want to hear. Yeah, just like those like foreign affairs and foreign policy and war on the rocks. Like once you get sick, once you, you hit it, you want to keep it. You want you know, success. And I think also that people in the, so in Washington, there's a there's a lot of snobbery, a lot of snootiness. I mean, I'm look, I don't want to overemphasize this for your viewers. I don't want to cast it like it's a huge, horrible jungle. It's just mostly a huge, horrible jungle, <laughs> not entirely, with notable exceptions uh, everywhere. Right. You know, but 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 by and large, the older the think tank, the more gravitas it has, just mm -hmm. like an Ivy League school, like, right? So even though there's a lot of colleges and universities that are much younger who do a great education because Harvard was 1636, they've been around the longest. That being around the longest has its own sort of, you know, credibility that may not make sense in the policy world. But having like foreign affairs is very like they're always saying, you know, I mean, sorry, Brookings or so forth, Council on Foreign Relations are always saying that like they've been around practically the longest or the longest. And they always are using that. And people are like, oh, well, you must know what you're talking about then, which if you think about it, is an illogical causal relationship. Well, I mean, the, the, the argument would be we've been around the longest, so we've been able to attract the best talent because of the resources, et cetera. That would be the argument, but- Yeah, is that true um, though yeah. is the question, yeah. So that's the, that is the argument that we are the best. Everybody wants to come here. We can be choosy. And, you know, to some point that's true. I mean, right. if you if you wanna, you know, I mean, they say that DC is Hollywood for ugly people because it, it's all about what makes you, it's a, it's a one industry town and it's all about, in some ways, driven by vanity and the illusion of power. There's no bottom line. It's not like Wall Street where there's, we could talk about how the the, the, the private sector has its own problems, some Bernie Madoff and other things. But at least there is some rigor with profit and loss. You know, when it comes right. to policy, like what does freedom look like you're trying to achieve around the world? You know, what is liberty? What is fear from hunger? I mean, and so you have a lot of squishy metrics, a lot of vanity and ego. And so they are, are the ones who want to go to, you know, these are people who want to be superstars and they go to superstar places or places that can produce superstars. And so that's another thing. And that's not always bad because you can harness ambition this way, but you also produce a lot of empty suits as well. And, right. and those, and that's another, because without the, and this is going to sound like I'm a warmonger, but if you're in a total war for, for, for national survival, those people get cast to the edges pretty shortly or they get killed. And because at some point people become desperate and they've got to innovate or die. And a country like ours is so successful. We're a victim of our own success. Mm -hmm. And I think that China and Russia 
on their better days are like, well, the first hole of rule digging is don't let them, you know, let them keep digging their own hole. And so they try to use nonlinear things to keep us from knowing that we're at war. And there's, there's this concern in which we can discuss a different segment that the U.S. may already be at war with China and not know it yet by Chinese design. You know, it's sort of well, what's that, what, what's, that, what's that saying? Uh, hard, hard times produce hard men. Yeah, um, hard, uh, you know, or uh, hard men, hard, yeah, yeah, hard, hard people, yeah, uh, produce soft times, soft times produce soft people, yeah, soft people produce, produce hard, hard times. times, yeah. I think, as you know, I think in some ways we're a victim of our success. I mean, it, it is, it, you know, it is amazing that if you look at this country 100 years ago, you know, Great Depression, we were a scrappy country. Look where we are today. And, you know, that is a success story. But we also have to be vigilant. And I think we have to be, the question is, do we become like Colonel Jessup on the wall of Guantanamo Bay from the movie A Few Good Men? You know, like, how far do we go down that road? But I think when we care more about whatever dress, you know, Kim Kardashian is wearing, or her latest tweet about a private airplane, more than we care about some other things that I, I see, you know, I think that's a, that's a concern, but I think it's also, it's a, it's a problem of plenty in some ways. I'm very problem. proud. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a tough way, but yeah, so it's a long, it's a sort of a meandering conversation about where did all the good strategists go? We do have good strategists. We've just got to find and cultivate them and put them in positions of power and deal with some of these bureaucratic issues and some of these political pointy nonsense, the greasy pull of that. Can we do it? Well, I hope so. All right, my friend. We uh, took it way longer than I expected, but it was a good discussion. So thank you for coming on and look forward to our next chat soon. Okay, good. Thanks, John. Always good to be in your show. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.